Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar on what's in your water, water quality and the economics of pump systems. I'm Ellen Crane, the Extension Coordinator for the BCRC, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. This session will last approximately one hour, but may go longer depending on the number of questions you've got for us during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, tweet along with us tonight using the hashtag BeefWebinar. We are recording this session and I will email out the link to the recordings to everyone that registered in a couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight and want to watch it again later, you can. Of course, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presentation presenters, but we can't or see you. If you want to communicate with us, type into the small chat window in the control panel at the side of your screen. If you have a question or comment for me or either of the presenters, that's the place to do so. And feel free to send any questions in at any time and we'll answer those at the end. If your internet connection is a bit slow tonight, it might help to close other programs that you are using, the internet, that are using the internet as well, um, or it may help to close your webcam window or window, which means you wouldn't be able to see us, but you'd hopefully be able to hear the audio coming through. Um, and it'll get the slides to load a bit faster for you. Uh, so with that, let's get started. This is what we'll be covering tonight. You're going to hear from two speakers on the webinar. They will each be talking about uh, water quality and we will open it up for Q&A after they are both done speaking. Uh, so with that, let's get started. Oops. Our first speaker tonight is Leah Clark. Leah is a livestock specialist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture. Leah has an MSc in Agriculture from the University of Saskatchewan with a major in Animal Science and a minor in Rangeland Resources. Her MSc thesis in Animal Nutrition focuses on wheat-based distillers grain as a protein and energy source for beef stock or cows and extensive grazing programs. She maintains an active interest in water quality and ruminant nutrition. Tonight, Leah will be speaking to us about water quality. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Leah. Thank you. So I'm, there we go. So I just wanna thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about livestock water quality, a topic that I'm really passionate about. And before I begin, I just want to say thanks to my colleagues for helping me put together this slide deck, sharing some of their slides, and with helping with data collection for, for some of the numbers that I'm going to use throughout this presentation. So with that, we'll jump right into it. So I just wanted to start off by talking about the importance of water. Water is the most important essential nutrient. I oftentimes refer to it as the forgotten nutrient because I think lots of times we're content just knowing looking any further into it. It's, Im it's important for critical functions in animals, water intake, the absorption of other nutrients, and overall productivity, general health, weight gain, milk production, and fertility. Um, I think at this time I might just turn off my video cam just to save my connectivity here. Um, oh, it looks like things have stabilized. So other ways that water is important in animals' bodies is that for it's used in the elimination of waste products of digestion. It's used to regulate blood osmotic pressure to transport nutrients, hormones, and other chemical messengers in the body, and it aids in temperature regulation. If we just look at sheer, vol sheer volume in an animal, a cow is made up, give or take 75% of water, and a calf 80% of composition is, is water. When we look at needs, a cow needs nine to 21 gallons of water a day. Now that's a wide range. And the two main factors that affect this are lactation and warm temperatures in the summer. Just to further um, 
talk about the importance limiting water availability to cattle will depress production rapidly and severely. So poor quality drinking water is often a factor limiting intake. And when we limit intake, we limit production. And oftentimes, I don't think we necessarily address this or can measure this, this effect of limiting intake. So what are some factors that affect production uh, present in our water? So hardness, alkalinity, TDS or total dissolved solids, conductivity and pH are general parameters that we can test for in water. We can look at specifics as well in terms of nitrates, sulfates, iron, sodium, manganese, uranium, arsenic, the list really goes on. And then from there we can start, we can identify individual different bacteria in the water, look at things like turbidity, organic matter, um, individual toxins, other contaminants, industrial, agricultural, pharmaceutical, really the list is endless. And it seems like every time I look into it, there's another efficiency being made in what we can test for, or another item that we can identify. At the end of the day, the factor that affects production the most is, is water availability. So one of the most common factors that we look at when we are assessing water quality is TDS, total dissolved solids. And a lot of our dugout, um, people that dig our dugouts or are drilling our wells, they'll do a quick TDS measure. And so total dissolved solids is a measure of the salinity. It's the sum of the inorganic salts dissolved in our water. So those salts include sodium, calcium, chloride, magnesium, sulfates, nitrates, iron, and there's others as well, but those are the most common. When we look at levels of total dissolved solids suitable for livestock, the tolerance varies among classes of and species of animals. But if we look here at beef cattle, the maximum tolerable limit is four to 5,000. One to 3,000 is ideal. Um, three to five, we, we know that that starts, that we can start to see diarrhea and effects on, on feed intake. For cow-calf pairs, 5,000 is our, our limit. Sometimes recommendations go up to 7,000 for yearlings, but we, we for sure know that there's, we'd start to see decreasing gains at those levels. So I'm gonna talk about uh, some of our experiences with testing livestock water and some of the lessons that we've learned. So hopefully um, others don't have to learn these lessons like we did. So one of the options that we have is to use handheld meters in the field and handheld meters test conductivity. Some of them state that they test total dissolved solids, but essentially what they're doing is they're testing conductivity and using a conversion factor to come up with total dissolved solids. And that conversion factor is 64%. For those of you nerds in the crowd that want to know the conversion factor. But they're not testing TDS, they're testing conductivity. And that's what I really want to, to drive home today. And so we did lots of testing of water sources, and then we compared those tests to lab analysis um, using the Roy Romano Provincial Lab here in Saskatchewan. So again, if there's one thing you take home with these handheld meters, just remember that conductivity is not the same as total dissolved solids, and those meters only test conductivity. So what is conductivity? Electrical conductivity, it's the ability of the water to carry an electric charge. Electric conductivity increases with ionic concentration and therefore it's related to total dissolved solids. However, it's not consistent, consistently related to total dissolved solids. So different ions carry the electricity differently. Therefore, each sample will be different. So what we found in the last two years is that conversion from electrical conductivity to total dissolved solids was anywhere from 60% or to 115%. So a really wide range. So I just wanna give an example of what that wide range can do to us when we're trying to get some accuracy um, and some accurate recommendations for livestock suitability. 
So we get an electrical conductivity reading of close to 6,000 micro siemens per centimeter with our handheld meter. And the handheld meter is programmed to do a 64% conversion to give us a total dissolved solids of 3,600 micrograms per liter and parts per million, that's the same thing. And we say that's acceptable because that's below our 5,000 that we talked about beforehand. We use a conversion factor of 50% to get to sulfates. I'm gonna harp on sulfates a little bit more um, ahead, but we use that 50% conversion and say, yeah, it's still suitable. So we're good to go, you can use this water. But what was happening is we were sending it to the lab to just double check our recommendations with the same electrical conductivity. We measured the total dissolved solids and we got over 5,000, which is not, not recommended for ruminants, unacceptable. And in fact, the conversion was actually on average in 2017, 91% conversion in, of all the water tests that we tested in Saskatchewan. So not at all close to that 64% that's um, been researched and, and programmed into a lot of those devices. We measured the actual sulfates and there we go, they were above a recommended limit, which I'm going to talk to later. So unacceptable again. So the main take home here is that that conversion factor programmed into those um, handheld meters are not accurate. And they're probably regionally specific. So portable meter accuracy, we ran into another, another issue and it had to do with some meters just seemed to be more accurate than others. And another point to, to mention is that the probes on some of those handheld devices are meant to be changed every year. So on the top left, this was the, the portable meter that the office in Moose Jaw had purchased, one of those handheld devices in the picture previous. And the red line is the lab, the blue line is our meter. And as you can see, as the concentrations, the electrical conductivity increased, the accuracy decreased. And that's when we need it to be more accurate um, to make good recommendations for producers. A similar, similarly priced handheld meter that we were given from one of the local vet clinics to test against the lab was bang on, um, as you can see in the bottom right there, uh, showing that, you know, something that we need to be aware of, of the accuracy in testing and calibrating these um, meters, as I know that they're becoming more popular. So we decided that we need to get a little bit more serious about this. We knew that with the dry conditions, surface water quality in the summer was something that we could help producers with. So we got a more robust uh, measure and we got this, this new unit that's pictured here. So the testing take home messages that we brought from that year was that the lab test was the gold standard. The hand meters were screening tools and good screening tools, if accurate, but the quality was, was variable with those handheld meters. And we also learned that those conversion factors are a weak link. So just reiterating that that lab data from 2017 indicated that TDS was 90% of conductivity, not 64. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sulfates because it's an identified problem across Canada um, and it's available in, in the soil and gets it, it's just in our water because of that. So excess intake of sulfur may cause drug toxicity, but often the detrimental effects are associated with metabolic interference. Sulfur interacts with trace minerals in the animal and can lead to trace mineral deficiencies, either by outcompeting other trace minerals for a absorption or by binding minerals for absor absorption. So an example of that is copper, molybdenum, and sulfur uh, forming thiomolybdenates that are unavailable to ruminants. Excess sulfur impairs thiamine synthesis as well and so the lack of thiamine can result in central 
central nervous system lesions, and that causes polio or sulfate induced polio is sometimes how it's referred to. So, to look at sulfate recommendations, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine puts together beef requirements, and they state that the suitable level for sulfates is 0.15% of the ration because sulfates are a, a required nutrient. The max level that they state is 0.3 to 0.5% of the ration. Now, this data is estimated based on data research uh, primarily focused on dairy animals. And we know that dairy animals are just a little bit more sensitive than our beef cattle. So um, we're not, not completely um, convinced with these numbers. So what are some symptoms related to, to sulfates and how they affect the animal? Well, diet can affect how sulfates interact in the animal, the rumen environment, the existing mineral status of that animal, the length of exposure of those sulfates, the form of the sulfur itself, and then acclimatization of that animal. And we're assuming that there's more um, that we don't even really know of yet, but we know that there's lots of factors affecting how those animals react to sulfates. So we put together this sulfate guide for producers and it's, largely based on that 0.4% max level uh, for ruminants and put together by anecdotal evidence that we just have seen and experienced in the field. So what we put together is that less than 500 milligrams per liter or parts per million, it's the same thing, is satisfactory. In fact, that's good. And that would even be an acceptable level for humans. Five to a thousand, we would, expect there to be potential for subclinical trace mineral deficiencies, especially in high performing cattle, just because their metabolism is going all that, that much faster. So trace mineral supplementation and monitoring is important at those levels, especially for, for those high performing cattle. It's still good quality. 1,000 to 2,000, we would say use with caution. We know that trace mineral supplementation would be needed. Um, it may affect performance and health status of these animals. And there's pretty good evidence supporting that, that there's clinical deficiencies of those trace minerals. That greater than 2,000 milligrams per liter is risky. We expect there to be severe clinical deficiencies would be likely. We would start recommending chelated trace mineral supplementation and monitoring. These animals may not respond to supplementation. Performance and health status effects would be most likely pronounced and risk of death by polio, especially in those high performing cattle or animals under stress. And we've definitely um, have witnessed polio at levels exceeding 2000. So we put this, this um, chart together to defend kind of our 2000 limit because we get some pushback from that 2000 limit. Some people who have animals that are acclimated to high sulfates um, go higher than this, but we stay, stay at this 2000 recommendation. And this is the main reason why. The, the first reason is we've seen uh, polio at level at, at when sulfates are around that 2000 or just above. And then the second reason is this, keeping to that 0.4% of sulfate for the diet. So we're looking at three different temperatures here, four degrees Celsius in blue, 20 degrees in red, and, and 32 or a hot summer day in, in green. And we're looking at different um, water sulfate levels, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 grouped together. And so when we get to that 2,000 parts per million sulfates, the second grouping in, all of, all of the, the intakes or total dietary sulfates are above the recommended 0.4. And that's assuming a 40% forage diet and that concentration of sulfates in that diet at 0.2, which is pretty common. So that's just backing up our recommendation of 2,000 parts per million sulfates. 
So when we take that a step back to the conductivity, because that's a quick test that we can do in the field, this is what we found, found through our sensitivity and specificity testing. Um, and I just have to give a shout out to the, the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, who, um, in, in particular, John Campbell, who helped us out with this. So what we found is that if conductivity, so that quick test, is less than 3,500 microsiemens per centimeter, then sulfates would most likely, uh, I believe in 97% of the time, would be less than 2,000 milligrams per liter. So if you have that conductivity meter, 3,500 is a good number to keep in mind. And if conductivity is less than that 4,250, then sulfates would be less than 2,500. So 2,500 is a number that people tend to, to go to um, in the winter just because intakes of water is lower. So we can get away with it. So trying to put a cost on high sulfates. We know that trace mineral deficiency is one of the symptoms of high sulfates. So that can lead to fertility, have fertility implications, delayed or lack of cycling, sperm production. We know that it can affect weight gain, metabolism, feed intake and water intake, effects on immunity, um, skin integrity that could be related to um, foot rot. And so really the question becomes, how do we quantify this? How do we know how much of these are related to the sulfates? And how do we know what those sulfates are if we're not testing? So we, we started testing in 2017 uh, when we knew that there was a problem in, in Saskatchewan with our surface water, with, with the dry temperatures that we'd been having. And so close to 600 samples that were done out of one office, close to half of them we had to tell producers were unsuitable for cattle. So some difficult conversations and really a difficult summer when it came to water quality, but we learned a lot from it. Last year with 513 samples coming through our office, the number of unsuitable water sources dropped to 21%. It was still a hot and dry summer, uh, but there was better runoff and it was probably enough to dilute those sulfates in, in the dugouts. So taking a step back, other components that can be elevated in water and, and cause us some troubles with livestock, one of them is nitrate. Uh, nitrates are usually an indicator of contamination, wellhead contamination or a fecal contamination, urine and fecal contamination in a dugout. So the level that we use there is 100 milligrams per liter. That's the cautionary limit for livestock. Now we say caution because in reality we should be looking at the total diet nitrates and this in the winter is extremely important because we tend to feed higher nitrate feeds in the winter and green feed tends to be our biggest culprit. So those annual crops, when they freeze, they accumulate nitrates. So what we're really after is getting that total dietary nitrate to 0.5% of the total diet. And if you get above that, talk to a nutritionist um, because there is some, some ways to get animals above that and get accustomed to those higher nitrates. Another component in, in water that can cause us trouble is sodium. So 800 milligrams per liter is our upper safe limit. We know when it gets above that, that it reduces feed, water, and mineral intake. One of the things we've talked about sulfates already, but sulfates are lots of times in the form of sodium sulfate. So when our sulfates are up, our sodium is up in water. And a lot of our mineral products have sodium in them or salt in them to to encourage intake. And so when sulfates are an issue in our water and it's maybe causing trace mineral deficiencies, it can be compounded with the salt in the mineral. And so those animals just don't desire the salt and don't go after those minerals. Sodium can also cause diarrhea. And so our recommendation there is to limit high salt forages. Another component is iron. So usually, it's a nuisance problem. Uh, it's, it's a bigger molecule, easier to filter out. It can affect palatability and reduce water intake. And anytime you reduce water intake, you reduce feed intake. 
they go hand in hand. And it interacts with other elements to impact metabolism. So an example of that is um, ferrous sulfate, and it just binds to receptors or, or is uptaken by receptors more potently, so it outcompetes other trace minerals in the ruminant animal. So what happens in the summer? So four things that I think really affect water quality in the summer. Number one is that water demand increases. So those animals are taking in more water. And the dose makes the poison of a lot of these dissolved uh, things in the water. So when their, their demand increases, um, that dose increases. Water quantity decreases from consumption of those animals and from evaporation. And when we have no rainfall to recharge these sources, good water is evaporated out and those um, other minerals and undesirables, let's call them, concentrate. So poor water gets worse and we have that concentration effect. Another thing is bacterial growth. Uh, bacteria like usually like heat um, and and so that and sun, so that bacteria growth can can provide some contamination. The picture on on the right there, the graph uh, supplied by Colby Alford, he took samples of uh, three dugouts in an area, and he just looked at them over the summer. And so the three colors indicate three different dugouts. So at the beginning of the summer, they were all suitable for for livestock consumption. That top dugout. Um, by midsummer was no longer suitable for livestock. So things can change quickly. So I'm going to take a step back and talk about algae and bacteria. So algae can be an indicator of water quality. They grow rapidly in warm stagnant water that's high in nutrients. And so those nutrients can be brought in by lots of times it's just brought in from animals having direct access to water and fecal and urine contamination. Another issue that we see and, and is um, get a few calls about at this time of year is smelly bacteria. Um, but that's how the calls come in is I have the this water has a smell. And so smelly bacteria can persist in the winter months where there is anaerobic bacteria or bacteria that don't need oxygen. And when there's nutrients present that those bacteria can live off of when you have like a wet well beside a dugout, this, this smelly bacteria can become a problem. And so it really just puts those animals off. They're, they're not as inclined to drink it. Although in most cases, it's not, a, it's not doing them any harm. They just don't like the smell. So they most likely wouldn't eat as much. So I ha when I talk about water quality, I just I have to talk about cyanobacteria or blue-green algae because it is something that we're up against in the summer months. So here's some pictures of blue-green algae. The thing with blue-green algae, or I'm going to say cyanobacteria because it's actually bacteria, is that it's fine as it's growing and when it's happy. It becomes a problem as it dies and is stressed. So that's when it releases the toxin. So when we treat, we just have to remember to keep those animals off that water source for 14 days, 10 to 14 days, because that's when the, the toxins are released, when we kill them. It can also just take a windy day to start moving the water and allowing oxygen to, to kill or stress those, that bacteria and produce toxins. So cyanobacteria can produce neuro or liver toxins depending on the type of, of cyanobacteria. There's lots of different types of cyanobacteria and only certain ones even produce toxins. So they can produce neurotoxins or herpetotoxins depending on the cyanobacteria present. The neurotoxins are fast acting, can cause paralysis of the skeletal and respiratory systems. The hepatotoxins affect the liver. There's a longer time to death. There's also other symptoms when they don't become this extreme. So scouring, mental derangement, muscle tremors, stiffness can also be a sign of cyanobacteria toxins. So a little bit more background about cyanobacteria. It's true bacteria, not algae. It's planktonic, which means it's free floating in the water. And what, what I mean by that is when you put your hands up to grab 
some water and just make a little bit of space between your fingers. The water just, the bacteria moves with the water through your fingers. It doesn't get caught, it's not stringy, it's not slimy. It can look green to dark brown, even red. It can look like grass clippings or pea soup. Sometimes it looks like, I like to describe it as green paint poured into the water and just on the surface. At the end of the day, uh, cyanobacteria try to confirm ID before treating because it may be confused with beneficial algae. And that's probably one of the, the things I see the most is that it's just, it's green and so people want it gone and it doesn't necessarily need to be gone. So here's some examples of beneficial bacteria or beneficial plants that it can be um, confused with. The main one on the right here is duckweed. Lots of times cyanobacteria is, is confused with duckweed, especially immature duckweed or really small duckweed. So duckweed, you can see the, the hair-like projections going down from, from their, they look like mini lily pads. And they're actually beneficial um, because it floats on the top of the water and reduces the light of the blue-green algae. So the blue-green algae needs light to survive and thrive. And so lots of times it's, it's the duckweed that outcompetes that blue-green algae. So with all these things, nutrients, direct access um, of livestock to water increases these things being present. The one thing with duckweed is as it dies in the fall and decays over the winter, um, it releases nutrients as well. So we do recommend that if there's a windy day closer to the fall and you see all the duckweed on one side of the dugout, it, if you can rake it out, you're raking out nutrients that, um, and potentially increasing water quality for the next year. So talking about decreasing bacteria and algae, so tr treatment essentially depends on the problem. There's registered products available for certain product problems. We can use management to reduce nutrients. I've already alluded to that, just keeping animals out so there's no feces and urine uh, providing nutrients. In doing that, we also get some other benefits like controlling erosion of the sides of a dugout, for example, just increasing the life of that dugout. We can use aeration for a lot of these problems. Uh, for for blue-green algae or cyanobacteria in particular, there's dyes that we can use to help the growth of that cyanobacteria. And then in the end, I know I've said this a few times, identification is key. So now what? Um, I've kind of gone through all the problems and been a Debbie, Debbie Downer for, for a while here, but we have the ability to deal with some problems in water quality, quite a few of them. It requires commitment, it requires some money, but at the end of the day, it requires testing. We have lots of tools of it available to us when it comes to, to water quality and interpreting those results. So one of the main ones um, is Cowbytes. Cowbytes is a ration formulation software put out by Alberta Egg. They have a water quality um, component to that program. And then Alberta Egg has a water quality tool. Um, nutritionists, your regional specialists are also a good, good place to go. So here's some pictures of us testing livestock water. And this is another source of great information when it comes to livestock water quality. So it's called Livestock Water Quality, a field guide for cattle, horses, poultry, and swine. Uh, if you Google that title, um, this PDF will come up and it is a great source of anything water quality. And with that, thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Leah. Our next speaker is Brenna Grant. Brenna is the manager at Campax Research Services. Brenna monitors data from national statistics, oversees the development of new economic models to make annual outlooks, and evaluate the impact of management decisions on cost of production. Tonight, Brenna will be speaking about the economics of water testing and pump systems. And I'll turn that over to you, Brenna.
Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Leah, for that excellent overview on water quality. Um, just a clarification, I'm only going to be talking about the benefits of watering systems. And so this doesn't deal with um, treatment of water, um, the water that you're pumping in to a trough um, is still the same water quality um, as it was before. So if it has high total dissolved solids, um, it's not going to solve your problem. Uh, but um, Leah mentioned this. Um, you've got a variety of ways that you can have surface water contamination that have negative implications on the environment where you have nutrient contamination of water sources. Um, cows and fish um, notes that about one in four times or 25% of the time that a cow is standing in water to take a drink, she's going to defecate. And one kilogram of phosphorus derived from manure can feed 500 kilograms of algae. And we've just heard about the implications of algae and specifically um, blue green algae toxins. And yes, Leah, I know I'm using the wrong word there. Um, but you also have herd health implications in terms of decreasing the immune system um, as well as reduced weight gain. So as Lee has already noted, improved water palatability increases both water and feed consumption. As cows drink more water, they also spend more time eating and therefore produce more milk for their calves. And if a cow is eating about 12 kilograms of forage a day, she needs anywhere between 9 and 13 gallons of water to digest that. And when the water is clean, um, she's more likely to drink more and spend more time drinking um, in order to fulfill those needs and therefore consume more forage. So calves that have access to clean pumped water and the cows that they're drinking from uh, have access to clean pumped water were on average 9% heavier at weaning time. And that's usually about heavier, um, sometimes 16, and we'll see that a week later on. But the effectiveness of any water treatment and improving cattle weight gains um, really is related to that improved water palatability um, being provided to the animal. So some other potential benefits of implementing a water system is having a longer water source. And so you can decrease the erosion at your watering sites. Um, also, as the heat of summer goes on and your water is evaporating and your dugout is being drawn down, instead of having a mud hole come August, um, you might have that last foot of water that you can still be pumping into a water system and therefore improving pasture, pasture usage um, throughout the year and having water available in different pastures. In the wintertime, it can also provide safer watering sites for livestock instead of having them going out on the ice. And cows that are in better body condition going into the winter need less winter feed um, than cows that are thinner and um, need a wee bit more extra in terms of feed over the winter months. Um, cows and fish has done a lot of work in this area. And when given a choice, cattle will drink from a trough eight times, eight times out of 10, even if they have access to surface water. And this means that if an offsite watering system um, is available, uh, it can really help maintain your riparian areas and the water quality. It also means that you don't have to be fencing out your water sources, but remembering that cattle tend to do most of their loafing um, and resting around the water sources. So even just moving at a short distance um, from your riparian areas can improve water quality. And it's a good thing to remember that if cattle have never seen a water trough, um, introducing them to a water trough so that they know that there's one there um, is a good idea and a good best, best practice just to ensure that you don't have cattle um, dehydrated um, and looking for water in other places. 
there are a number of different types of water systems available. Um, there's different pumping systems, whether they're wind or solar powered or underground pumps. Um, and it can be from a lot of different sources, whether it's from a dugout or a well or a wet well. Um, and then you have treatment options. Um, I have uh, geothermal here. Um, this is not something that we evaluated and looked at, um, but we do know that it's an, an option out there for people to be looking at, um, particularly for winter systems uh, where you've got concerns around freezing. So we looked at some research and at the Western Beef Development Center, uh, this is back in 2005, uh, they had um, measured the impact of water quality, <clears throat> excuse me, on 44 yearling steers over five years and 40 cow-calf pairs over three years. Um, and they evaluated average daily gains on both of those. And they looked at different systems, whether it was a pump system, it was an aerated system, coagulated, or direct access to water dugout a dig out water um, and then evaluated them. And so this just shows two time periods, early summer and late summer. And you can see that you had the additional weight gain that you saw on the calves, in this case, 16 pounds um, over the two time periods. And for the cow, you had almost 50 pounds of additional weight gain. And uh, the additional weight gain on the cow over the summer means she's not going to need that additional feed going into winter. Um, and you also have other benefits as cows in better body condition usually have higher reproductive efficiency and are going to have healthier calves. Um, but for our situation, we only looked at the economic benefit coming from the 16 additional pounds from the calf that's what you're going to get paid for. Um, and so just know that these numbers are going to be conservative because you're going to have other benefits as well. So we then looked at and costed out a number of different systems. And these are not the lowest cost systems. We just looked at a number of different suppliers across Western Canada and said, if we were going to buy everything we needed for each of these systems, what would it cost us? Um, Obviously, you may have a supplier that has lower costs um, in your region. Um, and you can also do something like the photo um, with a homemade tire, which could also reduce your costs. Um, so wanting to encourage you to um, calculate these for yourself, to price things out for yourself, um, and know that there are other ways of reducing these costs. So we then looked at what would it take to pay off that initial investment on three different water systems for a cow-calf herd, looking at the windmill, the solar powered, and the underground pipe. And so remembering that um, these are all based on uh, the same 16 pounds of additional weight gain for that calf. Um, so the differences are really being driven by the different costs. Um, for these different systems. And you can see that at 300 head or 300 pairs, that your cheapest system is actually the windmill. Um, and then when you've got less than 300 head, if you've got 200 head or 400 head, the cheapest system is actually the solar powered one. And the reason is because you're um, matching the water requirements to the water system in order to reach an optimum rate. And so, you had um, to increase the number of components that were purchased for a 300 head herd um, in the solar powered system. And then you saw your economies of scale then kick in again when you hit that 400 head herd size. And these are all based on um, a calf price of about 220 per pound, which is where we've been over the last several years. And so overall, we looked at some different herd sizes, 50 pairs, 100 pairs, and 200 pairs, looking at the different systems and would they pay off um, over a five-year period. And with all of those systems, um, you needed 100 pairs or more to pay all of the 
to pay off the initial investment within five years. Um, with 50 pairs or less than 100, basically it took longer than five years to pay off. And the 2016 census of agriculture noted that the average herd size in Canada is 69 head. And so that's sort of just a reflection of what um, some of the adoption rates for this are, is it's an impact of economies of scale and herd size. But we're going to talk about that um, a wee bit later on about ways that you can address some of those disadvantages if you've got smaller herd size to still make it feasible. Um, so we've seen uh, a really big jump in calf prices since 2014. So prior to 2014, the long-term average for calf prices was about $1.60 per pound. And so you can see that the time to pay off any of these systems for a 200 head herd was anywhere between, um, basically it required more than five years. But current calf prices at about that 220, you've got all of your systems um, being paid off at less than five years. So it really makes um, a big difference at current calf prices. It makes this more feasible for producers to be investing in watering systems. Switching gears a little bit to look at yearling steers. Um, the Western Beef Development Center um, also looked at yearlings, um, specifically looking at uh, treated water um, that was aerated versus untreated water. And what they found is if you didn't treat the water and you simply pumped it, you got an additional 10 pounds um, at the end of the grazing season on yearling grassers. But if you not only pumped, but you also aerated it, you more than doubled that to 22 pounds um, at the end of the grazing season. And so having clean water um, really matters in terms of livestock performance. And so then looking at the number of years to pay off the initial costs for different herd sizes um, of grazing of yearling grassers, uh, you can see that while aeration has 11% higher costs um, because the benefits are more than double with those average daily gains, um, the time it takes for those aerated systems to be paid off are significantly lower um, between one and two years compared to the untreated systems that take between two and a half and four years to pay off. And you can also then see the economies of scale um, in this graph, just like we saw earlier, um, between the 400 and 500 head, where the cost is basically the same for both of those herd sizes, because again, you're right sizing um, to that herd and you had to um, purchase additional components in terms of having an adequate um, water capacity for those additional head. Um, by and then this is again looking at um, the period, the time period it takes to um, sorry, the net benefit under different herd sizes. So anywhere between 100 head to 500 head under the four different systems. Um, with the aerated systems, regardless of your herd size, um, there was a net benefit after five years. Uh, with the untreated systems, um, if you had 100 head or less, it was actually a still negative um, after five years. And then again, looking at the impact of price, prior to 2014, um, yearlings averaged between $1.30 and $1.40 per pound. And so that's on the left-hand side of the chart, um, where it's taking anywhere between two and five and a half years um, to pay off a watering system, versus current prices for yearlings um, are around that high 170 or that um, mid 180. Uh, and that significantly um, reduces the time it's taking to pay off that initial investment. So we developed a water system calculator for BCRC, and there's two variations of the model. We have the cow-calf model that evaluates the windmill pump, the solar-powered pump, 
the underground pump, and looking at two different supplies of water, whether it's from a well or from a dug out. And then we have the yearling grasser model that also includes um, aeration treatment or the option of not having aeration treatment. And it's got the flexibility of allowing producers to input their herd size, their infrastructure, as well as their current and projected market price um, to help them decide uh, what their situation um, and which situation, what option would maybe work best for their operation. So if we go to BCRC and then go to decision making tools, um, there's a water system calculator. And when you get there, this is what it looks like. And so you can put in your herd size, um, that's the box in yellow, and then you can tell the calculator if you need to drill a well, or you can say no if you're gonna be using the code. And then you can tell it if you want to um, purchase and install um, tanks, or if you're gonna have a homemade solution, you can say no. And then you just say how many dugouts you can use in this. If you have multiple dugouts because you're going to be using the system in multiple um, pastures at a time, or if you have one system that you're just going to move around um, between different locations, um, you would just put one. And so it then calculates um, the volume needed. Uh, and this is assuming that you're going to have basically a day's worth of backup um, if you have that system go down. And then you put in an anticipated sale price. And this is the results that you get. Um, basically, it goes through the information we showed you before, where you have um, that additional 50 pounds of gain on your cows and 16 pounds on your calves for an additional $35 per head in value at the end of the grazing period. And then look gives you estimated costs as well as maintenance costs for each of these systems. And I'm not showing all of them, but all of them are provided in the calculator. And so then it shows you the number of years to pay off each of those systems. And in this case, the solar powered system was the shortest time period to pay off. And then it provides you a cost benefit as well as the maintenance costs for each of those different systems. And then in the yearling grasser system, it's the same. You can put in your herd size. Again, indicate if you're using a dugout or a well, and if you're purchasing tanks or providing your own. And the difference here for yearlings is um, in the daily water consumption for yearlings versus cows, as we saw in the other calculator. And again, showing the fact that you would have 10 additional pounds if you were using an untreated system and 22 pounds if you had a treated system for an additional um, value of uh, $18 per head on an untreated system and almost $40 per head in a treated system. And this is aeration treatment. Again, the cost for the different systems along with annual maintenance costs. And then here you've got the additional options um, on the number of years to pay off that system with the aeration treatments, whether it's a windmill pump or a solar powered pump being just over two years. And so our online water system calculator only looks at summer water system options. Um, we know that there are some winter frost-free systems out there, um, but we didn't calculate them. And part of the reason for that is when we were looking at the benefits, we were really looking at the additional value coming from the additional pounds weaned at the end of the summer. Um, but as noted, there are benefits. Um, in the summer uh, for your cow herd um, and additional weaning on your cows, as well as in the winter, uh, winter system um, can provide greater flexibility in terms of grazing management, um, getting out to maybe some swath grazing or some other areas that provide other management flexibility for producers. But we just would encourage all producers to run their own numbers to determine what options is most appropriate for their operation. Um, and just noting that uh, water systems um, have really varying levels of adoption rate across the country. 
Um, these are from the most recent cow-calf survey results. And the highest adoption of water systems are in Northern Ontario and Quebec, where they're pumping water in both summer and winter with um, anywhere between 63% and 98% of producers um, providing pump water. Uh, but we have seen um, increased rates uh, from, sorry, varying rates um, in Western Canada with Alberta Agriculture reporting 43% and the Western Cow-Calf Survey reporting only 31%. Uh, but Leah's already talked a lot about um, the importance of water testing um, and overall the Western Cow-Calf Survey in 2017 noted that 59% of producers never test their water um, and that this is an area that we're probably seeing a lot of changes in um, in the last couple of years. Just in conclusion, uh, higher weaning weights on calves pay for the system, but maintain, maintaining body condition score on cows supports reproductive efficiency and can also reduce winter feeding costs. Aeration really makes sense and pays off for yearlings. And the higher cattle prices since 2014 have made water systems more affordable with a shorter number of years to pay back the initial investment um, since then. And you've definitely got economies of scale with watering systems uh, with a longer payback period for smaller herds. But there are a number of provincial programs um, that are available. Um, Alberta Agriculture currently has a program out that covers anywhere between 30 and 70% of the costs, and that's the Environmental Stewardship and Climate Change Producer Program. Um, other provinces have also had um, programs available over the years, um, but they vary quite a bit. And I'll turn it back to Ellen. Ellen. Thank you very much, Brenna. Um, We'll now start taking some questions. Um, you can answer those in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, there you go. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can start typing those in there now. Um, I've got a couple here already. Um, I think this could go to Brenna or Leah. Um, could you put up the slide again where you can get uh, water tested in Alberta? where they can get it tested in Alberta. Leah or Brenna, maybe it might have been Leah. Uh, I didn't actually have that in my slide deck. Brenna? Um, I know it can be tested in Alberta, but um, the program, actually let me just, Do you want me to share that again? We can do that maybe. Sure, yeah. So it's the Environmental Stewardship and Climate Change Producer Program. And if you want to email me, I can um, send you the information sheet um, because it this is actually in the most current cap program in alberta um, for 2018 to 2023 or Brenna, it, if you want to send the information to me i can include that in the follow-up email that would be great um, yeah. because this is actually for both summer and winter systems um, just to note, I also, if she's looking for specific water testing labs, um, if I just Googled feed and water, Alberta Gov, and they have a list of feed and water testing labs um, on their website. Okay, so we can list some of those in our follow-up email as well. Um, another question, this may be for Leah. Um, how often should water be tested in a barn system? 
So I'm assuming a barn would be a well. And so well, depending on the depth, the deeper wells tend to stay more consistent than shallow wells. Um, but I still would recommend a yearly test on a well, especially if there's a time of year that you use that barn more than others, you know, before animals enter ideally would be, would be ideal. Uh, when it comes to a dugout, I usually recommend at the beginning of the season, after the runoff has come, just to get kind of a baseline for, for the dugout quality and then go from there, decide, you know, whether there's risk to that concentration being a, fat, a problem. Okay. Uh, this would be for Brenna. Um, how much, um, if any, does aeration increase the evaporation rates in pumping systems? I actually don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Leah, do you have any idea? You know, I don't, but I, that is an excellent question because we have seen huge evaporation happen over the last two years just with the dry temperatures. So I'm sure it would increase that evaporation. Unfortunately, I don't know. Okay. Um, for Leah, are there any regions that you know of would have um, higher concentrations of sulfates or they should be more concerned with sulfates? So I know that it's a widespread problem uh, across Canada, um, but it really has to do with, with the soil and, and what the soil um, has or the composition of the soil. So what I would really recommend is get that base test done, identify what dissolved minerals um, are there and you know, what your TDS is to start off and you, you know, you, get, you gain a wealth of information from that. Uh, can producers collect water samples themselves? Absolutely. So if it's coming through a system, uh, we usually we usually recommend letting it flow, especially from a well, let it flow for a while um, to make sure that the lines are flushed and you're actually getting a representative sample. From a dugout, we recommend going in and grabbing a sample from what, wherever the animals are drinking. Um, and just make sure that you're not stirring up that water too much when you take that sample. Uh, most labs for a full like general chemistry analysis usually need about a liter. We recommend putting that water in a container that a beverage container that has just been rinsed out with the water you're about to test. Uh, with that general chemistry, you don't need to keep the water cold or in any special location, it's there, everything's pretty stable and send it into the lab. Okay. Um, if a producer was to get a water sample completed, um, can they get any assistance with understanding what that water sample means? That's something that the lab can help you with? So uh, from my experience, um, most of the labs have a 1-800 or one 866 number associated with the water analysis output. Another place that I go that I really like help with helping interpret the information is Alberta Eggs, Alberta Agriculture's website has a water, um, water a few water tools, but one of them is how to read your test tool. Um, and then from there, um, we, in Saskatchewan, we have prevent, er, livestock specialists around the province, and I'm sure that there's livestock specialists in other provinces that could help with that as well. Nutritionists are also a good resource. Um. We talked about nutrients that we should be monitoring during warm weather. Um, is there anything that should be monitored during colder weather? So in the warmer weather, I, I focused on the summer because that's when concentration happens with evaporation on surface water. But that being said, 
even in other times of the year, those sulfates can be elevated. Those dissolved, different dissolved minerals that we went through can all be elevated depending on the source. So, so summer and surface water can compound the problem, but there can still be similar problems in other sources, wells throughout the winter. So getting that test again is, is key. Okay. I think that is the end of the question. So uh, just before we go here, um, to stay connected with us, um, you can join our email list to learn more about future webinars, new articles with production tips, latest research results, and more. Uh, you can visit our website, beefresearch.ca, and click on the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list. If you've got Twitter, Facebook, or a YouTube account, you can connect with us there. Um, the next webinar will be on cover crops, and that will be on Tuesday, March 26, starting at 7 o'clock Mountain Time. Um, you'll receive an email from me in the next couple of days with a link to watch this recording, as well as links to some of the additional information on water quality and pump systems, um, some of the ones that we mentioned this evening. Uh, you'll also receive a link to a survey, so if you can take a few minutes of your time to fill that out, that really helps us with developing our future webinars. Uh, that's it. Thanks to you at home for joining us tonight, and on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you to Leah and Brenna for volunteering your time and expertise. Good night.